All right, so a faithful few, we battled through the traffic. We got here, and we made it. So I, I, I figured out last week, because I had a number of positive comments about the content, I thought I could stop preparing Bible studies altogether, and all I'll do each week is just pull out the writings of the saints and start reading from them. It'll be uh, much, much simpler for me. You know. <laughs> but we will do that from time to time. They're a great resource. And I do encourage you, as, as I say, to read the classics. They're there, they're classics for a reason, and keeping company with the saints is a great way to learn their habits, to learn their lives, to learn their minds, which is very close to the mind of Christ. Obviously, the Bible is our primary source because that is the very Word of God. But these others certainly help us to gain perspective, gain insight. So with that, let's pray and ask for God to guide us tonight. A good and gracious God, we do thank you for the incredible richness of life that you give to us. So many dimensions to our life, and we sometimes get stuck in them. But we even look at the way you gave us your son. We see him in the poverty of the incarnation. We see him hanging naked and penniless on a cross. And yet we also see him as the king of glory in the transfiguration, seeing a greatness beyond any monarch on, on earth. And then even after the resurrection, coming in some simplicity. So all these various ways in which you ask us to be, please help us to not get stuck in any one, but to read your scriptures, read your word, seeing all the different ways that we can be, sometimes one and then another, sometimes all at the same time. There's a very rich life. So bless us now, guide us by your spirit. Teach us tonight, teach us through whomever you inspire, and teach us through what we hear from what is said as well. We pray this and put ourselves into your hands through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. So you'll find uh, handouts tonight again. We have the one we had last uh, time from the beginning of James 5, and you have the conclusion of James 5. So there actually is an end to James. Um, we will get there. As I mentioned when we started, this wasn't going to be six weeks in James, but rather uh, typically we explore. We learn about Bible study as well as about James and we take it wherever it goes. And we see all of the various tools that we have and how much work goes into Bible study to read it for all of its meaning, to get as much as we can out of it, as opposed to just sitting down and reading the book in 20 minutes. So we've been reading the book since March 30th, I looked. So we are coming up to a year in James. So let's find out where we left off. I think we left off on slide 115. And again, to get context, we will read the fourth chapter again. Before we do, as, as always, any thoughts, anything you read this week, in any Bible reading, any thoughts, ideas, anything on James 4, before we read it from top to bottom? All right. Oh, Leslie? Oh, you're just adapting the ca adjusting the camera <laughs> with a raised hand. <laughs> All right. James 4. Where do the wars and where do the conflicts among you come from? Is it not from your passions that make war within your members? You covet, but do not possess. You kill and envy, but you cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not possess because you do not ask. You ask, but do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Adulterers, do you not know that to be a lover of the world means enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a lover of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that the spe Scripture speaks without meaning when it says, the spirit that he has made to dwell in us tends toward jealousy? But he bestows a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you of two minds. Begin to lament, to mourn, to weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil of one another, brothers. Whoever speaks evil of a brother or judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save or to destroy. Who then are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, 
You who say, today or tomorrow we shall go into such and such a town, spend a year there doing business and make a profit. You have no idea what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a puff of smoke that appears briefly and then disappears. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills it, we shall live to do this or that. But now you are boasting in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, it's a sin. All right, so again, we left off the very last verse last time. So we'll, uh, we'll review quickly and then cover that last verse and then jump into chapter 5. So what did we see, kind of as, as an overview of James 4, to give it context? So we came in from 3 about these sources of strife, you know, about false wisdom, about the use of the tongue, and then he gets down to the real cause of the strife, coming back to, again, the way we are. You know, these two ways of living for self. Do we take because we want for ourselves? Do we ask and not receive because we're asking for ourselves? Adulterers, are we trying to live both the Christian life of love and the way of the world of self. So we took that big digression into the prophets about spiritual adultery, showing how it was both the false, uh, incorporating false religion, and how it was also relying upon political alliances instead of God, doing things the world's way and trying to do them God's way at the same time. And then we see you know, that God gives us grace to overcome the spiritual adultery, to truly live this one way. And to do that, we need to humble ourselves, seek him, and resist the devil. We saw the parallel in 1 Peter 5. We spoke about how it's not a matter of cowering in fear when we resist the devil. It's, as Robertson's words picker said, picture said, it was to take a stand. We talked about becoming lion hunters, right? Not only for our sake, but for the sake of those around us, to protect the entire village, to actively drive out evil, to actively drive out darkness, because indeed, light is not challenged by darkness. It's the other way around. Darkness flees before light. We just need to make sure we're in the bed of light instead of in the bed of darkness. We spoke about this being wretched and mourn, uh, this recognizing our misery and having to do that, as Teresa of Avila spoke about being in that room of self-knowledge, that very important room, and that as we see ourselves, we see how great God is, and then we're supposed to leave that room to, to dwell upon the greatness of God because it helps us see ourselves more clearly. And then we journey through these rooms towards the center of the soul, as she describes it, the central, central room where the Lord himself lives. We spoke of the judging. How if there are, there are times to judge, right? We looked at 1 Corinthians 5, and we looked at Romans 14. And if the issue is judging about the law, how people are keeping it, well, then we're basically saying the law is not good enough. We become judges of the law. And who are we to do that? And then we landed in the section where we spent most of our time last time about the self-will. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the other, as opposed to what it means to truly cast ourselves into God, to truly give up that will. And we looked at the writings of St. Faustina, the writings of St. Teresa of Avila, both on this concept of self-will and how, how profound that is. It's not just the occasional, all right, I'm not going to be strong-headed, but what a complete giving over of one's life it was, of this living our life by doing the love that's in front of us, trusting God that he's weaving our lives in the way that it needs to be, and so we do what he puts in front of us, sacrificing our wills to what he wants us to do. And so we finally came down to this very last verse, that whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin very different approach to how we often think of sin, right? Sin is, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. And suddenly we're being told, well, you know, if we know to do right and we don't do it, it is sin. So as you can imagine, there's a little bit to, to pull out of this verse. And so we do speak of sins of omission, right? The confidior, we, we pray, you know, that I sin through my own fault, my thoughts and my words and what I have done 
and what I have failed to do. And that's an important part. In fact, I find most of the time when I'm in confession, that's what it's about. It's all the things that I have failed to do. And this isn't just a New Testament concept. It's not just a Jamesism. Again, it's the same mind throughout the Bible, just writing to a different people. In the Old Testament, writing to a people who generally do not have the Spirit with them, except for you know, the prophets and some select ones who did. And in the New Testament, writing to those who do have the ability to think and to feel and to act as God does because of the Spirit. So even in the Old Testament, we still see these glimpses of this holiness, of this living as God does within his righteous ones, his holy ones. Let's go to 1 Samuel 12 and 23, keeping this in mind, that we, what, to him who knows to do good and does it not, it's sin. And this is an interesting perspective on prayer. It's in this chapter where, if you recall the history, we have the Israelites come out of Egypt. And when they first come out of Egypt, who's, who's, who's the king when they first come out of Egypt? Is it David? No. Is it Saul? It's no one. It's, it's actually, it's God. And this becomes the issue. So the, in the, they first come out, they're really not a unified nation. They're a collection of tribes who are settled in this one area. In fact, in the book of Judges, when we, if we ever get around to talking about the book of Judges, you'll find that it's very localized. It's not about the entire nation of Israel. There's this issue going on in the south, and there's this issue going on in the east, and then there's this other one going on up in, in the north. Uh, because it's very regionalized. It's not a unified nation. It doesn't become a unified nation until Saul, and even then it's a little sloppy. It's on the David that he becomes the great king, uh, bringing about the great nation of Israel. So during this period, they're ruled by the judges. You know, Jephthah, and, and well, the last one here is Samuel. There's, there's Samson, there's, you know, there's a number of them. And so Gideon. So, Towards the end of this period, Samuel is one of the first of the prophets, and he's the last of the judges. And the people see that his sons are not really following after him. And rather than trusting God to take care of the situation, they go to Samuel and they say, please give us a king like the other nations. Sound familiar when we spoke about spiritual adultery? How in the Old Testament we have this idea of trying to do things the human way, while at the same time while trying to serve God? like they were making alliances with all the nations later on in their history. In this case, they say, we want a king, like the other nations. And says Samuel, Samuel says, you don't want to do that. And God says to Samuel, it's okay, give them a king, tell them how bad it's going to be. They haven't rejected you, they've rejected me as their king. And so Samuel gives them the news of what the king is going to be like and all the things that are going to happen to them because they have not trusted God and shows them this king, and they're a little shaken up. And they turn to Samuel, and Samuel reassures them in this section of Scripture, in 1 Samuel 12. And he says, For the Lord will not cast away his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. But notice what he says next. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord, by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and in the right way. Now, that's interesting. That's, again, not normally how we think about sin, is it? We're thinking about the rules. We're thinking about the, you shall not do this, you shall not do this, and you shall do this. And instead, Samuel is saying, far be it from me that I should sin by ceasing to pray for you. That I should sin by stopping by, that I stop caring for you, that I stop loving. Remember how we, we said when we covered in Matthew 5, you know, this being struck on the other cheek, that sometimes, yeah, we do allow ourselves to be struck, and sometimes we say, no, you can't do that. But the underlying factor is that we never stop loving. It's not about defending me, it's what am I doing for you, even as you are hurting me. And the same thing here. They've just rejected Samuel. They, they don't want judges, they want the king, and yet Samuel would not sin by stopping caring for the people. To do that would be sin, because to do that would be to be unlike God, who never stops caring 
no matter how far we stray from him, no matter how much we've done to him. It's this whole season of Lent, right? The initial reading is on Ash Wednesday. The readings that we'll have is, is all the evil we've done, and yet God still calls us back. He doesn't wish that we should die, but that we should live. He never stops loving. And so far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord to cease to pray for you. Very much the idea that James is bringing us here, whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it's sin. Why? If it's right, it's what God is. And if we refuse to do it, who are we rebelling against? God? And what do we call that? Sin? So a terribly important idea, you know, how this takes us so much beyond the idea of just adhering to a set of beliefs, adhering to a set of rules, that Christianity is not a religion. It is the miracle of God living in us. And so if Jesus living in us by the Spirit moves us to do this thing, he says, okay, you, you gave me your body, right? You gave me your will. You gave me your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. So here, I'm using it. I want to do this. And you say, oh, not today, Lord. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe. Depends on what it is. Now we are indeed sinning because this is the heart and nature of our life, of our religion. It is God living in us. And so if we fail to do what he's asking us to do, that is sin. Romans 14, 23, the same idea. But he who has doubts is condemned if he eats. The subject here, if you recall in Romans 14, was judging each other over food. You know, I fast twice in the week. You don't fast twice in the week. Oh, I only eat vegetables. No, I eat meat. I eat vegetables because of my righteousness. No, you're weak in faith. I eat meat because I can eat all things. Um, and they're getting into these arguments about how they're keeping the law, judging the law. Right? And so Paul is correcting this. And he talks about, but he who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Again, getting back to our spiritual adultery, right? Which better we in? If the things we choose to do are coming because we are listening to the Spirit within us, giving our bodies and our wills literally to Jesus to live in us, this is faith. And if it's not coming from that, why are we doing it? <laughs> What bed are we in? So it's, it's, it's such a different way of looking at it. Whatever does not proceed from faith, not in a negative way, not in a, uh-oh, I'm sinning again, oh, uh-oh, guilt, 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 but in a very positive way that we have Jesus living in us. And so we have this faith, this life in us. And so we hold to it. It's not just a matter of struggling against sin and, and fear. It's not just a matter of conformance, but of living. Not holding to rules, but letting Jesus live in us. It's not a matter of resisting evil. All right, I, 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 I made it today, tomorrow I hope I don't fall. But it's a matter of obliterating evil. Of saying, I have this life within me. Let me follow it. Let me live by my faith. Let me live by the life of God within me. And when we do that, we drive out the evil. We drive out the sin. If we spent all our lives living our faith, would there be any room for sin? No. It's like filling you know, the glass with water drives out the air. Filling our lives with faith, following Jesus, doing what he leads us to do, obliterates sin. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Doesn't put it in a box, doesn't contain it until it can get out. Just vaporized, gone. That's living by faith. That's whoever does not do what he sees to do, the right he sees to do is sin. Let's take a look at a couple of other places where we talk about this idea that when we have Jesus living in us, because we want that, that's all we want. It's the only thing we want. Why would we want anything else? When we do that, life becomes about doing the love he puts in front of us. Right? The earthworm prayer. Make me an earthworm. Take whatever is in front of me and leave something better behind. You know, so whatever God puts in front of us, we take that and we do it. 
We use that opportunity to love. As I say, I spent so many years trying to you know, figure out how to save the world and recognize that knowing God's will is just do the love he puts in front of you. That's God's will in that moment. Look at Proverbs 3 and verse 27. Proverbs 3, verse 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow, I'll give it, when you have it with you. When there is love to do, and God puts it right there, we do it. Doing the love in front of us. Remember we looked at, at this scripture. 1 John 3. And this was a pivotal scripture for us when we were doing our foundation series. Right? When we asked, what is love? How do we know what love is? This love that we're supposed to be living, that's supposed to be key to our life. And God shows us. It's why he sent Jesus. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay, so our time during the day isn't for us, it's for others. Our money isn't for us, it's for others. Our talents, our gifts aren't for us, they're for others. As Jesus came and laid down his life, we are called to lay down our life for others. Not in big gigantic things, okay, that the house is on fire and run and, and, and save someone. Every day, our choices in what we eat, how we dress, what we do, who we smile at. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. Now, usually when we read scriptures like this, we're thinking in terms of goods, right? I have the world's goods, so I'm going to give them and take care of them. But it's more than that. It comes back to, as he says in verse 16, to lay down our lives, our time. I find this interesting. It's not in your notes, but let's go to Matthew 5. This is in that section about striking on the other cheek. If he takes your cloak, you know, give him your coat also. If he wants to walk one mile, walk two. And he says... Jesus says, give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. And normally we're thinking about money or goods, right? For most of us, what's even more valuable? Time. So and suddenly that need for, for help, that need for love is in front of us, and it's going to cost us not money, but time. Give to those who ask. Give and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. That's a real challenge. This comes back to that whole idea of self-will. How do we live a life of self-will without completely abdicating our responsibilities? Now, we obviously, we have to do things. We have to plan for our retirement. We plan for the bills we've got to meet next week or next month. We have to plan for the things we have to do in life to take care of people in our lives. So we plan these things, right? That's okay to plan those things. In fact, we should plan those things as an act of love for others. But then something happens. Right in front of us, there's this call to love. So what do we do with the plans? Do we persist with our will? Or do we say, all right, I'm being asked, let me give. That's a challenge in real life for every day. How do we live without our self-will? When we're so willing to do the love in front of us, rather than the love we had planned. I don't know for how many years I've tried to do God's work my way. <laughs> and realize that wasn't getting me very far at all. Not that I should be looking to get anywhere. And how much I needed to stop doing that. And I needed to do God's work God's way. Now, I always look at it as, a, as a great example. In fact, I ask him for his prayers in this regard. It's St. Anthony of Padua, right? One of the great saints of all time. Great miracle worker, great preacher, tremendous preacher. And yet, what did he want to do? He wanted to go to the Middle East to try to either convert the Moors or be martyred. 
So what does he do? He gets on a ship, he goes, he gets dreadfully sick, and they have to drop him off someplace else in Italy, I believe. You know, so for the next who knows how many years, the only thing he does, he's a porter in the friary. You know, the one who's at the door, opening the door, greeting people, letting them in. You know, he's, he's completely frustrated in serving God the way he wants to serve. You know, and then one day, the Dominicans and the Franciscans are getting together for this great conference together that they're having, and they realize they didn't plan on anyone speaking. So they turn to Anthony and say, well, you speak. And of course, the rest is history. God had different plans for him than he was planning. All those years he spent trying to serve God his way, and God had something so much greater in mind for him. And so for us, this is how we live our lives without self-will. Yes, we plan, we have to be responsible, but we always yield to what God puts in front of us. With wisdom, you know, we, need, we have to ask, and, you know, is this really going to be the wise thing to do? Remembering that wisdom is the how, not should I do this for myself? Okay, I'll, I'll do this good because I can do this at the same time and it's really not going to cost me too much so I'll, I'll be able to do it. No, that's the world's wisdom. It's okay, I need to love. How do I love? And in some cases it might be taking the time to address this issue right now. In other cases it may not be, but again it comes back to what's the underlying factor. I'm choosing to love. I'm giving up my will to do the love God has put in front of me. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. That's God's will for us. Following the Holy Spirit as it guides us. Right? That whole foundation section was, what is Christianity? What is this Bible about? And it's about becoming divine. How? By the Holy Spirit. So if that's the case, we've got to listen to what the Spirit says. Right? 1 Thessalonians 5.19, one of those memorization verses. Very simply, do not quench the Spirit. Okay. If the Spirit is leading you to do something, who are we to say no? How do we know if it's the Spirit? goes back to how we had that whole section about it. What is it leading us toward? Toward self, towards other. We can see a similar admonition as we look at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so let's give ourselves some context again. Let's come back to, to James 4, 17, just re -re so we reread it, not get too far away where we were. So James' point is, whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, to him it is sin. How did Jesus finish the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Okay? Evil cannot overcome us if our life is faith. If we are always tuned to the Spirit, always doing what the Spirit leads us, evil can't win. It is doomed. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand, the life of self, the self-will. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house and fell, and great was the fall of it. So we're going to do what Jesus says, or are we not? And the one who says not to him, it is sin. It will result in destruction and failure. So as we said, it's not enough to just resist evil. That's not what our life is about. That's not what Christianity is about. Holding to the rules and not, not doing any of the, violating any of the thou shalt nots. If we don't do righteousness, we don't actively do righteousness, we're not going to build a righteous, eternally sustainable lifestyle. Right? Go back to the foundation series. Go back to the plan. What's God doing? He has made us for eternal life, right? He hasn't made us for death. He hasn't made us to live 50, 70, 90, 100 years and die. He's made us to live forever. But we said to live forever means living differently. 
Right? We said if a system that has to be up 99% of the time is designed differently than a system that has to be up 99.99999% of the time. And if you think of it, God's system has got to be up 100% of the time. There is never a time in all eternity, ever, 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 where God says, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to do something for me today. It is always love. And so the only way for us to be able to live in that same eternity is to be the same way. So if we're not actively doing righteousness as opposed to just avoiding evil, we're not building that lifestyle. We're not building that life because heaven will not be resisting evil. Heaven will be doing holiness, be doing righteousness. Comes back to where we began in James, right? At the very, very beginning of James. James 1, and in verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, that hupomone, right? That staying under, that being able to, to stand against that evil. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So it's doing that righteousness in the face of any headwind, of any evil, that builds in us that character, that builds in us that steadfastness to always follow God's will, to always follow the life of Jesus as we say, here's my body, here's my soul, it's yours. And he says, thank you, let's do something today. And that's how we wake up every day. We wake up in the morning, I'm yours. What adventure do we have today? It really is. Life is that good. I wake up with my beloved, I say, I'm yours. And he says, yep, let's go. What adventure shall we have today? Sometimes it's quite an adventure. <laughs> right? so, so we need to do this righteousness. And if we don't do this righteousness, we're departing from God and therefore it's sin. Right. So now the only remaining question for this verse in my mind is why did James put this here? Right, we had this whole section about strife and about spiritual adultery and about pride and, and humbling ourselves before God and recognizing our misery, uh, about not being self-willed. And then he puts in this he who does not do the right, for him, it is sin. Why? It could be any of a number of things. It could be just the subject we've been talking about, right? He just came off of this whole section of self-will. And when we don't do that right, what are we doing? We're being self-willed. Just like saying, today or tomorrow we'll go into the town and do this, as opposed to the love that's in front of me. There could be other things, too. He may be simply just admonishing his readers, saying, okay, I've instructed you. Now you need to do it. Whoever is not going to do this is departing from the way you know. So it's going to be sin. Or he may just have a, 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 in mind the connection between knowing God's will and the need to do it. Let's take a look at Luke 12. Luke 12, verses 47 and 48. The master who knew his, oh sorry, the servant who knew his master's will, but did not make ready or act according to his will, shall receive a severe beating. But he who did not know and did what deserved a beating shall receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much is given, of him will much be required. And of him to whom men commit much, they will demand the more. If God has been so gracious to us, as to enlighten our minds by literally living in us. By just like we hear that human spirit telling us what to do, we're just intuiting what to do. When we hear that spirit of God telling us what to do, or intuiting us what to do, and we don't do it. How much more could God entrust to us than his very life? How much more can God give us than his very spirit and grace to make us divine? So we're pretty accountable. And if we don't do that, to us, it is sin. If we do do it, to us, it's eternal life. And he will give us the strength to do it. So there we have 
James 4, and we actually made it through the chapter. Now, I'd like to do something before we go into James 5. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take a break in a moment. But first, what I do want to do is figure about, now that we're, we have James 5, and I don't know, we'll spend a couple of weeks in James 5. I don't know how long it will take. But then we need to figure out where we go from there. I mentioned it to some of us while we were chatting. I think one night we didn't have heat, and we were talking about where to, where to go before we disbanded. Uh, but I did put up a little collection of ideas. So I put up a couple of ideas. These are just some of my ideas. If you have other ideas, like someone did suggest one, Jerry suggested one that I, I added into here. Uh, if you have some other ideas, suggest them. But let's together figure out where we want to go next after James. So a couple of things that I thought of. Uh, I thought of going into Colossians as a fairly short, not terribly theological book uh, to introduce us to the writings of St. Paul. So that's a fairly light way to get in into St. Paul. Um, some of this we may also want to base upon a time of year that we're heading into. So Colossians is an option. I uh, thought we'd go into one of the Gospels. Uh, we've done a lot in Luke already, uh, pulling out some of the parables, so I thought maybe Matthew, but we could do either one as an introduction to the Gospels. We could look at Acts as the life of the early church. There'll also be the readings throughout the entire Easter season in the Catholic liturgy. Um, or we could just take a tour through the whole Law, Prophets, and Writings to get an overview of salvation history. Uh, so that these things that are referenced in the New Testament will have some context. You know, what, what happened in, in Genesis? What happened with Noah? What happened with Abraham? What happens with you know, all the various characters, with, with David, with Hezekiah, with Josiah, with Isaiah? What are they about? Uh, another option is to look at the Psalms. Uh, Psalms can be an interesting study because Psalms are, are still to this day, are our prayer book. Right, the divine office, the breviary, is largely the Psalms. In fact, we could even do that. We can combine it with praying the divine office and how one actually prays the Psalms as opposed to just reading the Psalms. Um, a little more hesitatingly, I thought we could look at 1 John. My hesitation there is just, it's, it's so profound. It's kind of the heights of spirituality. It's like jumping into John of the Cross. Um, but there's another option to look at 1 John, a very different style of writing. Um, someone suggested we could look at a, a book highlighting women. Esther, Ruth, Judith. You know, great examples that we have in the Bible. Um, there are also options that we could take a break from study for a while. I know we have been going hard at it for coming up two years now. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot to absorb and sometimes their heads are probably going <laughs> um, And another option too is to say we, it's time to discontinue. The, the goal of the study, well the goal of the study was several fold. Again, our will was to see how do we go out and reach out into the community. It seems God had something else in mind. It's turned into more of an internal study. Um, and, but the other goal was that we learn how to study ourselves, to become independent Bible studiers. So we might as also say, well, it's time now for us to disband this study and spend our Thursday nights and hopefully sometime every day going through the scriptures ourselves. So that's an option too. Um, any other ideas or thoughts will stick on this list. So what I'd like to do is on the tables, you've got the Bible question form, just so that no one feels funny about any, any selection they make. Like, let's send nasty letters to the bishop about John because he drives me nuts. Um, just if you, if you would grab one of those uh, forms and just write where you think we should go based off of this list or anything else you have. Go ahead and fold it up on the, on the table and I'll go and collect them during the break and we'll see where everyone wants to go. So that's the thought. Colossians as an introduction to Paul. Matthew or Luke as an introduction to the Gospels. Acts as an introduction to the life of the early church. Uh, an overview of salvation history in the Old Testament. Uh, Psalms, 1 John, a book highlighting women or taking a temporary break or taking a permanent break. So go ahead and uh, write those down and we might as well stop the cameras and we'll go ahead and take our break.